Thank you. Um, that was probably pretty much word for word my introduction. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Sadie. That was, um, yeah, I will add one thing that um, I, am, I am here on behalf of Mola. Obviously, I work for Mola, um, but I've only put it as a little logo in the corner um, because actually I'm representing myself and my 15-year career, but I'm also representing archaeologists that I have spoken to um, as colleagues, but also, as Sadie mentioned there, as branch secretary for the archaeologist branch, obviously, um, we, without putting a too fine a word on it, we tend to get all the shit. We tend to get all the complaints, all the bad stuff. Um, so I'm bringing kind of a bit of a perspective from that side, a bit of perspective from working for Mona in infrastructure, and also um, kind of a bit of perspective um, from my earlier career as well. So I think I should probably try and explain a little bit about the title of my talk. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware of the fun scale. Um, there is a scale of fun. Um, I was not until earlier this year, um, and I actually put this post on Facebook, just as a bit of a joke, so I was like, oh, wow, there's a label for everything now. Um, but as soon as I put this up, the number of comments that came through saying, oh, type three fun, that should just be renamed working in infrastructure. Um, and it actually got me thinking. Um, it was about the time that Sadie asked, asked whether I'd contribute to the session. And it actually got me thinking about why, why do archaeologists particularly those that are working on site, think that working in infrastructure is type 3 fun. Um, why has it got such a bad reputation? Um, I mean, I'm not saying it's all the time, but why is there this perception that it's not a particularly fun thing to be involved in? And is there any cases or any time where it could be type 2 fun, maybe even type 1 fun? I mean, that might be pushing it a little bit. Um, I mean, often we see the infrastructure projects going for big industry awards, current archaeology being one of them, um, and the organisations that are running um, these projects. Kat was obviously talking about um, kind of joint ventures earlier. These kind of big joint ventures um, kind of just, you know, celebrating the projects that they've had. But then if any of you are following um, any diggers forum comments, any Badger comments, things like that, you can see a totally different point of view from the people that have worked on it. Um, so where is this kind of like almost like, I don't know, where is the junction between the two? Obviously, there's, there's an image that the companies have, but there's an image that the people that are working on the sites have as well. Um, and basically, through this talk, I want to explore, as I say, why, why it's type 3 fun. Can it be type 1 fun? And I think in Sadie's um, session abstract, she posed the question, um, can we improve or adapt our input to enhance the experience for the practitioners? Um, and I'm hoping that actually uh, throughout the talk there will be a little bit of doom and gloom, but I'm hoping that actually I can be a little bit positive and prove that I think that yes we can and that we can showcase um, some good examples. But ultimately these, the way that we improve the experience for the people uh, on the projects is to implement the change right at the beginning. Um, we have to be talking about the, what I'm going to be talking about right at the start of the projects and not when people have already set foot on the ground. So, to give you um, just a brief idea of what I mean when I'm talking about infrastructure in this uh, talk, obviously infrastructure is anything that um, enables society in a way. So it could be cables, it could be power lines, it could be anything like that. Um, I suppose what I'm talking about and the experience that I personally have and experience from uh, the people that I spoke to is, is what we call mega infrastructure. Um, so these are the big ones from the past kind of like 10 years. Um, there's a government paper that was put out in 2014 uh, that listed the top 40 infrastructure projects that would be completed in the next 20 years. Um, and this is just a sample of them. Obviously, archaeology doesn't feature in all infrastructure projects, um, but it does feature in, in a lot of the big ones because obviously they have a large impact on the um, historic environment. Um, something that I hadn't actually really ever sat down and considered when I was preparing this talk, I had a uh, look back through my old CV and where I had worked. And it actually turned out that in my 15 years as an archaeologist, seven of those has been spent on infrastructure projects. So personally, I've worked on two gas pipelines, three road schemes, three rail schemes, one port scheme, and the London super sewer. Um, and that's all the way from, um, well, archaeologist level, but entry level archaeologist, um, through to, as Sadie mentioned there, as site manager for HS2 Euston. So I've, I have got a broad perspective of things. Um, a lot of my recent experience is obviously London focused, but a lot of my earlier experience comes from, comes from outside of there. It also occurred to me as well that the only three times in my career where I've actually left a project or a site before it's finished 
were infrastructure projects. Um, and this does actually include being the site manager for HS2, uh, which I left early because I personally felt like I needed to be off that project at that time. Um, and I think that says, says a lot um, if you're willing to kind of give up a good job with some good pay um, because it's not suiting you as an archaeologist anymore. So I suppose the next question then is um, just how important are these projects to these people? I mean, I've just said that my 15-year career, half of it has been made up with working on infrastructure. So from that very basic level of having a job, it is exceptionally important. Um, I apologise, Sadie, I've nicked, I've nicked your talk and I'm going to slightly criticise it now. Um, <laughs> but um, I shouldn't really do that in a session organisation. Um, but I think a lot of focus, um, as I've mentioned before, um, goes into how important infrastructure is for other people. So whether that's the client, I mean, you can go onto the MOLA website and they've got the top 10 tips for managing infrastructure projects. They are very good and it is very useful, but it's very useful if you're a client or a subcontractor coming on site. Um, there's a lot of talks like these um, on the, about the public benefit of infrastructure, which is very valuable and we do need to be talking about those things. But there are a group of people, and it's these guys here, that often get left behind in those discussions. And there is, I think yesterday, unfortunately I wasn't at the wellbeing session, but somebody told me about, um, I think it was one of the guys from LP was talking about this kind of like just machine of churning people through these huge projects. And unfortunately, that's the experience that a lot of these guys have. They don't see these, these bigger pictures. They never get involved in a lot of the good stuff that can actually go on. And they just kind of like turn up on site, dig for eight hours if you're lucky, 12 hours if you're earning a bit of overtime, and kind of go out the other end. Um, there has been a little bit of discussion about the benefits. I think Jay Carver published an article about Crossrail, I think it was um, maybe five years ago now. And he touched on this idea that um, Crossrail had all these uh, apprenticeships available and that would benefit archaeologists. But it was one paragraph in a 10-page article. Um, and as far as I'm aware, that never happened. So whilst the discussions are kind of happening on the fringes, it's not really a focus um, of what's happening. So as I say, I'm really interested in the people that are basically experiencing this. Um, I mean, admittedly, these could be any archaeology sites. I think we've all been on sites like this, infrastructure or not. Maybe not dredging, I don't know, that's quite a specific one. But, um, but basically, this, this is the reality, and this is the resounding memory that makes working in infrastructure that type 3 fun, basically. Um, the mud. It could be the most amazing archaeology in the world. I mean, this is one from EA1, and um, I think I'm going to say it's some kind of uh, prehistoric trackway or something like that, but I might be wrong. Um, but it's amazing archaeology, but you just look at the conditions and you think those poor guys and girls working on those sites, the poor people managing them as well. I think often we can focus on the people on the ground, but actually the effect goes through anybody who's working on the projects right through to post -ex. Um So as I say, this could be archaeology, any archaeology site. And just how different <coughs> is it working on these projects? Um, for those of you in London, you'll probably recognise a few of these individuals floating around here. All of these projects, um, this is about a 20-year span of uh, burial sites in London. And bar the PPE and the branding, there's absolutely no difference to what those people are doing there. And indeed here, spot the difference? 20 years apart, there's not really... Please don't say anything to the guys next door that I'm comparing their, their roof to something 20 years ago. But, um, but yeah, there isn't, there isn't a great deal of difference on, on the surface to how we work. It's mainly behind the scenes where we have to start looking at how we can think about change and how these projects can actually help to enhance the experience of the people on site, whether that is the archaeologists, the site supervisors, the site managers or the project managers, and indeed a lot of the staff that support those projects as well. Um, one of one often overwhelming criticism of um, kind of large infrastructure work, um, one of the challenges is the kind of over overwhelming bureaucracy that happens on these sites, um, or the perceivement of the overwhelming bureaucracy. Um, policies, practices, they can differ. Usually if we walk onto site as our own principal contractors, we have a lot of control over what we do and a lot of things will be very simplified. We are suddenly thrown into these worlds where actually we've got to conform to their own, their different set of standards and that can be somewhat overwhelming. Um, 
this here, I've had to redact some of that information, um, but this here is the risk assessment for St. James's Garden. Um, Al will be also very familiar with this particular document. This is a bit of a legacy. I think Al started at one point and there's been a few people who have um, tackled it, but ultimately it's about 200,000 words of assessing the risks and managing them um, on an archaeological site. That's well beyond anything that I've ever written. I'm never doing a PhD in my life, but I'm considering this my work, my thesis. <laughs> um, and this is the kind of thing that, pe that people often feel like they're being hit over the head with, that it's just creating barriers, um, that it's just a negative document that kind of instills a bunch of rules that don't really make sense. Um, an example of that, I think some of you, if you're ever on the A14, will be fully aware of the no welly rule. Um, that was something written into the uh, risk assessments because they felt that Wellington boots didn't have ankle support. Never mind the fact that the archaeologists were sending knee deep high in water most of the time. Um, and it's just, it's, people perceive these documents as just barriers to, you know, actually having, getting the job done um, and having kind of a sensible approach. I think what can be a benefit to these kind of things though is immersing people in the experience i personally know that writing this document opened my eyes to a lot of procedures and a lot of practices that happen within um, infrastructure that i wasn't aware of now writing this document having it edited by ch davies some of the guys that are sat next door at the moment um, and then coming them coming back to me and having that conversation actually made me realize where they come from now i'm not saying i agree with the no welly rule on the a14 but I think that there are things that we just don't understand because we're not involved in the conversation early enough. And if we get involved in that conversation, then the information that's passed on to the team is much more relevant. There were definitely rules. Those <coughs> people in the room that um, worked on St. James's will definitely know of the rules that were just um, a bit overbearing. But hopefully, because we had done a bit more of an understanding of how they were thinking, we could <coughs> communicate them and interpret them in such a way that it actually became more relevant to the staff. Um, the other thing as well with things like this is they had, um, which is actually very good, we had three months reviews of this, so this had to be reread and rewritten every three months. But that wasn't me, that was the archaeologists on site that, we, that did that. They were taken out by CSGB, they took this document with them and they walked around site looking at all the risks and running through why they still needed to be in the risk assessment, why they needed to be edited or changed. Now that's a way of engaging people in the health and safety and the bureaucracy that's perceived on these sites. Um, and it's something that I just think creates a better understanding. And it's one of those kind of practices that I think could help to break down some of the barriers um, when working on these kind of large scale projects. Um, another thing that I think we can learn from <coughs> as well is um, welfare. These photos are obviously from some very central London sites with some very nice setup. I don't think that many people have Machu Picchu <laughs> as uh, a vinyl on the side of their, their processing room. but these are examples of what have been provided by infrastructure projects because they have the money, but not only the money, but they have the contracts with the cabin companies, with the PPE companies, uh, with lighting, with um, IT infrastructure companies. And this is all things that we should be using. Now, I'm not saying it would be easy to get that set up out in the middle of a field in the Colne Valley, but if they can provide that here, there is absolutely no reason why that can't be replicated elsewhere. Um, I'll bring in a bit about uh, a bit of relevance that's been happening over TAG. Um, the mentoring group uh, producing their Seeing Red guide. I'm hoping that many of you will have gone down and had a, had a chat with the guys on the stall. Um, that kind of thing is actually the kind of thing that should be presented to HS2, to infrastructure projects, because these are the guys that actually can implement that kind of stuff. It's very difficult on low budget sites where potentially the archaeological contractors are the PC. Um, to maybe get that kind of thing. You have to have a very direct conversation with your managers. You might, it might be that they tell you they have no, no money, which is not an excuse for not providing good welfare. But um, these are the projects where we can set those standards. And with a lot of entry level archaeologists <coughs> coming into these projects as well, um, we should be raising their expectations so that when they go to the next site and they look around and say, hold on a minute, where's my uh, you know, large selection of archaeological sites on the wall? The builder, they might not get them, but at least they're asking the questions and they're putting that thought into other people's minds. So it's, I think it's about setting standards and getting, um, you know, kind of getting those expectations up a little bit. The other thing as well is that um, in London, we're slightly different. We often work on sites where there are principal contractors. If you work on a site with a principal contractor or other contractors as an archaeological contracting unit, you fall under CDM regs, so con 
construction design management regulations, um, which have some, I would say, very strict guidelines, but they can be interpreted in different ways. Um, strict guidelines about what welfare provisions you have. Rural archaeological excavations, where the only contractor on site is the archaeological contractor, do not fall under CDM regulations. That was something that was introduced um, quite a few years ago as part of a negotiation with Spain. Um, but it does mean that they don't have that to fall back on. But if you are out on a site in the middle of nowhere and you're working on a HS2 project or an A428 project, something like that, you have a principal contractor. Even if they're not physically with you on site, you have a principal contractor. So you automatically fall under CDM regs. So you can demand this level of welfare. And I think that's something that we need to be teaching people. And again, it needs to go back to right at the beginning of the project. There's no point halfway through people turning around and going, oh, we've only got one cabin and we could have six. Right at the beginning, we need to be having those conversations about, OK, we want six cabins. We're going to get six cabins. Um, that's a really specific example, but you kind of get the point. Um, another thing is about um, well-being. Um, obviously, a really big topic within archaeology and the why, and just generally workplaces in general. Um, most large infrastructure projects, most large <coughs> construction um, companies have quite robust well-being programs. Now, how well they're implemented is, um, you know, up for debate, but they do have them in place. They also have what a lot of the time we don't have is time and money to provide to these things. Um, I know that Caroline Rayner is stood next door at the moment talking about the well-being and mental health on Euston. Um, this is, for those of you missing it right now, this is it. Um, but um, basically, we were given the opportunity to create a, um, a friendly, inclusive workplace. Um, we were given the time, we were given training. They paid for, I think it was nine mental health first aiders. I'm not saying the mental health first aiders are the be all and end all, but they paid for the, that training. They also put a large proportion of our staff through half day awareness training. They gave us time to do things like this. So when it was getting towards the end of the project and it was getting really stressful on site, they let us turn the meeting rooms into little mini cinemas for half an hour at lunchtime so that people could come off site and completely switch off. Okay, showing back and how the cemetery site not necessarily. <laughs> but the idea is there. We had, this is, this is Cap here, crafting in the corner. We had crafting sessions. And then we had these whole wellbeing um, kind of areas with lots of information. You've got the badge of respect guide on there. You've got prospect guides for menopause, things like that. You've got LGBT information up there as well. And they were fully supportive of us doing this. It was, it was very good. Um, and I think this is something that we can buy into a lot more. Um, but again, right at the beginning of when we're finding out about these projects, the people that are doing the um, tendering, they need to be asking, so what welfare, what wellness policies do you have? How can we buy into that? And what can we provide um, within your policy to kind of sort all that out? Um, and again, I think it's an opportunity that is quite often missed. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I might be wrong, but I'm, I'm actually fairly proud of what the team at Euston managed to achieve uh, with mental health. And we're actually hoping that we're carrying it forward a bit into MOLA as well. Um, but it's, it's, it's just those opportunities are there and we should be taking them. And I'm going to touch a little bit on training, um, although Claudia has obviously covered this. Um, this is not specifically about archaeological training as such. It's about the training that we can buy into that's provided by the principal contractors and by um, infrastructure companies. Um, just to give you a quick flavour, whilst I've been at MOLA in the past like three years, I've perf because of working on infrastructure, I've been, I'm a mental health first aider, I've got a uh, triple STM, I've um, got a behavioural management qualification um, from Costain, um, and also, although this isn't quite relevant, um, I've also got seed survival training. So if I ever fall off a, a yacht in the middle of the Atlantic, I will know exactly how to survive for two weeks. Um, but these are all things that are available. And again, the question should be asked right at the beginning of the project. What, what training do you want to provide? How can we buy into your training schemes? Costain Sanska, sorry, Costain specifically, has a very good behavioural management course. Um, it was four weeks worth of training over a, a long period of time with lectures and homework. It was quite intense, but actually I learned a lot from that course. And I think it's the kind of thing that we could be using. Because, I mean, anybody in the room that's tried to manage a project knows you do not get any support and you do not get any training on how to manage people. Um, so again, I just think it's something that we need to be asking about um, early on in the projects and see what opportunities are there. Apprenticeships, like, you know, survey training, things like that, they're all there. 
It's just that often they're, off, they're offered to other people and not us. And I don't know if that's because they, they think we're not interested or it's because our managers, our contract managers are not asking at the beginning of the project and they've just not factored in the time. Um, and the time needs to be factored in for us to take full advantage of things like this. Um, and then kind of the final slide, although there is one after this, um, is about collaboration. Um, now, I, some of you in the room will be probably aware of these two bits of work that went on within HS2. Some of you will not, but be not. Um, so the one on the right hand side is about a collaborative approach that, um, again, it's written by Caroline Rayner, um, about working with CIFA. CIFA came to site and they came for a day. They met with the, con the uh, construction managers on site, uh, but they also met with the staff, prospective members of CIFA, members of CIFA, to talk around industry issues. And it gave people access to those members of CIFA who, um, no offence to the guys in the back, who are often sat in some lofty tower that nobody knows where they exist. And it actually gave people face-to-face -face time with those, with those people. And I think those kind of collaborations in, are important and should be embraced, um, especially when you've got big organisations that can provide the time for that kind of thing. Um, and the second thing is um, the High Speed 2 uh, TUC um, it framework. Unfortunately, there was an article about six weeks ago about how this has actually failed and that they're considering, um, the TUC are considering legal action because it's been broken. Um, so it might not be the best example. But um, it's basically HS2 made a commitment to allow unions onto sites to help with, um, you know, dealing with staff issues, things like that. Um, and I think things like this are really important for us to buy into and actually get to grips with because it means that we can have access to that staff can have access to resources that they may not have had access to before. So this is my final slide to kind of summarise my talk um, in one way. And many of you will have will have seen this picture before, but you might not have. Um, I said at the beginning of my talk I wanted to kind of um, showcase and realize the opportunities that can be available to people but the fact that you have to talk about these things early on and that you have to actually have that conversation before you get on site so that you can actually achieve what you want to achieve um, this photo was taken i'm going to read this so that i don't get it wrong and um, this photo was taken on international day against homophobia transphobia and biphobia um, this photo uh, basically we invited our staff just just made ahead and invited our staff uh, to dress in rainbow for the day um, I turned up in a slightly kind of like low-key rainbow t-shirt thinking, oh, okay, we'll just see what happens. I walked into the office with rainbow tutus, rainbow glitter, everything rainbow that you can imagine. And it was absolutely awesome. Uh, they put uh, banners on site, flags on site, things like that. So um, I went on site at break, at break time and we took this awesome photo. I mean, although there's a couple of grumpy looking people, they were, they were supportive <laughs> of the course, don't worry. Um, and, I looked at this photo and put it, when I got it back on my laptop and thought, you know what, that's one of the best team photos I've ever seen. Mm. Earlier in the day, there'd been a toolbox talk about this, the subject of uh, transphobia, things like that. And during the presentation, it had actually, the digital TV had actually been hijacked and interrupted. And one of the grounds workers had put on uh, some pornographic images. Um, some of the guys here received homophobic comments because of the fact they were wearing rainbow. But nonetheless, I thought this was such a positive image um, construction does have this negative image about not being inclusive. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to send this to the comms team. I sent it to our comms team and to the HS2 comms team. And I just said, look, this is one of the best photos for inclusivity on your sites that you're probably going to get. You just need to put it on Twitter, on social media, get it out there, it'll be awesome. You know what the answer was? No, we ain't doing it. There were two reasons why they weren't doing it. These two gentlemen down here because they were laying down, they said it trivialised what we were doing on site. <laughs> now, whether I agree with it or not, had I realised and had I given this a bit more thought and a bit more planning, I would have asked those two to sit up. If that would have meant that this photo could have gone on social media, I would have asked those two guys to sit up. And that's what I mean about having the conversations. I, I got this wrong and I could have made this a really good thing. Um, but also, I don't think that HS2 fully appreciated what this actually meant. And they were looking at something else in that photo and not the whole picture. Um, I have no idea how this ended up on social media or in people's <laughs> possession. But um, I think this, this photo kind of encapsulates what you could achieve um, if we just kind of work a bit harder and work together. That's it. Thank you very much. Thanks so much.